Well, good evening and hello there. <laughs> um, I'm glad to be on with you guys this evening. I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get to this next set of chapters in Pigs in the Parlor for those that are interested in this. Um, we've had some family things going on, uh, some pressing matters and uh, appointments and stuff that we've had to tend to, and so that kind of takes priority. And so I've had some time now to be able to look at these next two chapters, and I hope this is going to be helpful to you. So if you're new to this, I am doing a review of this book here called Pigs in the Parlor. This is a very well-known book that's used in the charismatic church, not by every charismatic, but those that believe in Christian deliverance, uh, deliverance ministry. And so I have been reviewing it and taking it a couple chapters at a time, and I'm hoping we'll get to finish it very soon because... Still got a ways to go, and at times this book can be painful to get through <laughs> because of some of the information that's in it and some of the teaching, teaching and doctrine that's in it. Tonight's chapters are going to be chapter 15 and 16. So chapter 15 is binding and loosing, and then chapter 16 is called pros and cons on techniques and methods. Now chapter 15, we're just going to dive right in so that way we don't waste time. Um, so chapter 15 begins on page 71 in this book. Um, and it, they begin with saying this, uh, the scripture declares that Jesus has given us power to bind and loose in reference to Satan and his cohorts. And so they then quote Matthew 16 verses 18 through 19. And so I'm going to quote this for you. I'm going to go over the gist of this, um, this chapter, and then I'm going to come back and address some of the issues. Happy Mother's Day to you, Janelle, and happy Mother's Day to mothers that are joining me on here. So um, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19 tells us, And I say unto thee, there, and I'm assuming it's in the King James in the book, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this is a very well-known passage that people go to in the deliverance ministry um, this is not uncommon to go to this passage because they'll say, well, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so <clears throat> um, what you're going to see here is that there is some contradiction in this of what they're teaching. Because when you look at the context of this scripture, unfortunately, it doesn't match up. So we'll get to that in just a minute. But this is a very well-known passage of talking about that we have power to bind and to loose but we really need to go back to the context of what that Bible passage is saying and understand that, that context in order for it to have the impact and the meaning that it does. Um, so that's their teaching is that the church has been given authority over the gates of hell. So this is what this is talking about. Then they go on to reference um, Romans chapter 5 verse 17. And they talk about in the sense that we are called to rule and to reign now. Um, with Christ. So Romans 5, 5, 5, 17. And again, I want you to think in your, in your mind, um, what is the context of the verse? Is it the context of what is, does it mean what they say that it means? We're going to, we're going to take a look at that. Romans 5, 17 says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Okay. So that one's been quoted in this chapter. They also reference Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, which is, is also a very well-known passage in deliverance ministry that talks about um, that the Lord has already bound up Satan, which I would agree with them on that. In that context, um, Jesus is, is addressing the Pharisees because they accuse him of casting out demons by Beelzebul. And so he says, can Satan be can Satan cast out Satan? A, divide, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And he goes on to talk about the strong man uh, has to first be bound before his house can be plundered. What does that mean? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so they say in this chapter, the Lord has already bound, uh, bound and he has given us power to bind again. And they do explain seemingly correct. Again, I would agree with this point. There's a couple of points in this chapter I agree with um, that, that it is correct that Jesus has bound Satan. That he was talking about that in that, but we'll expound on that a little bit more uh, from what that means. And they go on in this chapter to give an example of, um, Mr. Hammond does, he gives an example of his wife, Ida Mae, and when she worked 
in a bank and a man used to come in and he would curse her. He would curse in front of her. He would blaspheme God. He would use profanity. And they say in this book, I'm going to read on page 73, um, they were just learn. They, according to them, they were just learning about the demonic, learning about deliverance, and learning about their their authority and power. And they go on to say in this on this in this page says she was acting on the word that the Lord had given her. The next time the man came in the bank, he began to curse and blaspheme as usual. She stood a few feet away from him and under her breath began to say, "You demon of blasphemy! God has shown me that it is you. I have power over you to bind you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ." You cannot curse in my presence and take the name of my Savior in vain. Of course, the man heard none of this, but the demon was hearing plenty. The color drained out of his face and he began to gulp as though something was stuck in his throat. He never said another word of profanity. From then on, each time this customer came in the bank, she bound the spirits in him and he could not curse. The other employees noticed the change in his behavior and commented about it. They had no idea what was taking place, what had taken place, but Satan's power had been bound on earth even as it is already bound in heaven. And they refer, they proof text this by referring to another passage in scripture, um, the second half of 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the purpose the Son of Man was excuse me, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And prior to this, they say, Satan has his strong man appointed over nations, cities, churches, homes, and individuals. God is showing us that these strong men have already been defeated and bound by heaven's power. And then they, they quote 1 John 3 8. Now, is that what that means? We'll look at that in a minute. Um, now that is another popular belief in this in this doctrine, in this line of belief, is that there are principalities that are that are most definitely set over each territory. And sometimes Daniel, the account Daniel is used to support that with the Prince of Persia, that the angel had a hard time. He was battling it's the Prince of Persia. And then Michael comes in to help him. Um, that may be possible. Now, the question is, are we supposed to take authority over these principalities in these regions? Are we supposed to find out who they are? And this can really harken back to the Seven Mountain Mandate, if you're not familiar with that. But the Seven Mountain Mandate is something that's been written about and talked about. Um, but the Seven Mountain Mandate talks about how to take over the different seven mountains of culture. And I've read a book about this by Johnny Enlow several years ago that he talks about this and he expounds on an Old Testament passage in Deuteronomy talking about all the Hittites and the Canaanites and the Jebusites all represent each mountain and that, um, that there is a devil assigned to each mountain and that he believes he knows what the names of the devils are that are assigned to each mountain of influence and that the people, especially the, uh, the apostles in each uh, area influence need to take those mountains and before G Jesus can't come back until that's done that that again goes to dominion theology it's a whole other topic and I've talked about that on my podcast months ago um <clears throat> but I wanted to uh again talk about this and let me just say this up front um and I know I've probably said this before in doing some of these I understand that people are not going to agree with me on this and I'm not asking that you agree with me what I am asking you is that you go to scripture because I am not the barometer of truth here. What I am trying to help you do as someone who was part of this type of movement and is familiar with some of this stuff. I'm not an outsider looking in of going, I never participated in casting out demons and things like that. So I know that some people will say that and they'll try to say, well, you've never cast out demons and you've never spoken in tongues, so you can't say anything. Well, first of all, I don't have to have an experience to talk about it. Uh, I have scripture to go to that I can actually glean from and to that's the ultimate authority that I go to. And that's what we should go to as believers in Christ. But I also know that people are not going to dis are not going to agree and that's okay. And I'm totally willing to have conversations with people that I don't agree with. I'm not going to get in an argument with people and bicker back and forth and get into ad hominem attacks and block people and, um, do all that stuff. But I am going to have a mature conversation with people that I don't agree with because that, that's what we need to be doing. And um, we need to go back to scripture. So if you get upset with me for what I'm about to say, please just go back to, to the Bible and go back to scripture and test what I most definitely test what I'm saying. 
but also be willing to test what these people are saying. Because what I find sometimes is that people are not willing to test this. And because that they, they really love this book or they love other books or they love this person or that person. And if you go and say something out of concern for a teaching, people immediately push back on it and they go, well, you just don't have the Holy Spirit and you just don't, you just don't know God and you've never had that experience. So you can't speak from authority on this. And actually, I can speak from authority on that, but if even if I didn't have that, that's not necessary because I have the word of God to go back to, and so do you. And so we need to look at it in context and make sure, and my, I have great concerns with this book, as you've seen in other videos that I've done, but one of the things that really is kind of troublesome to me is that there are texts taken out of context in order to prove a point or prove a doctrine in this. So we'll talk about that. Um, they talk about um, loosing refers to setting the captive free, and they refer to Luke 13, verses 11 through 12, which is the account where um, the woman had the spirit of infirmity for 18 years, and she was bowed together and could in no wise lift, her, lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Um, and they go on to talk about this, about what it means to be loosed in the Greek which they do list several different definitions for being loosed. Um, but the issue is when you begin to look up the actual Greek word for in, in, in scripture, for example, when you use like a lexicon or you're using a, a concordance or a word study dictionary, whatever you're using in order to understand that word better, it's not like you can take all the definitions of that one word and that's what that one word means in that one context. It does, that, that's not how it works. So yes, that one word can have those meanings, but that doesn't mean that they mean all the same thing at one time. I hope I said that. I hope I said that okay. <laughs> I said that clear enough and it's not clear as mud. But just like with any word that we have in English, there are some words that have a couple of different definitions, but when we say that particular word, it does not mean that it has all those definitions at one time. Hey, Laura. So that's something to take into consideration with this, okay? Um, so the deliverance ministry, um, let's see. Excuse me, I'm trying to read through my chicken scratch here. Um, I'm kind of old school. I'm using my computer and also using uh, paper at the same time because I enjoy paper but I also enjoy my computer. Uh, so um, they talk about deliverance ministry, releasing the captive from the bonds of enslavement, which Satan has put around them. Um, and so I had a question here. When they say this in the book, um, they said uh, the victory over, this is on page 74 of chapter 15. The victory over demon spirits is already won by Jesus. As far as heaven is concerned, every captive is loosed. The principle is the same as in salvation. Now, I may be under, forgive me, I may be misunderstanding something here, but it almost seems like when I read this and then as I continue to read on, they make a distinction between salvation and then deliverance is still needed even after salvation. But salvation is deliverance. Um, and so let me just keep reading here for a minute. Um, they say, Jesus provided for every man's salvation, then why isn't every man saved? The blood must be personally applied. Every man who applies the blood by faith is saved. Those who refuse or neglect to apply that blood are lost. So Jesus has provided deliverance. It is finished so far as heaven is concerned. The key of loosing the captive is given to the believer. He can loose himself and others on earth because it is already done in heaven. So if the believer is already loosed and already free, then why do they need deliverance further? See, this is the, there were, this, this paragraph right here was confusing. As confusing enough as some of this is, and by the way, this book is for Christians. So this is not towards, this is, I have said this before in other videos. This, this book is not written for unbelievers. This book is written for Christians and it's telling them how to do self-deliverance how to, you know, that, you know, usually that demons come up through the mouth or the nose. That's not taught in scripture. That is a doctrine that's been taught through deliverance ministries. Um, that there are certain manifestations that happen. Usually you'll hear, you can even hear sometimes, I won't say all, but there, sometimes you will hear, hear deliverance ministers say, 
Well, did you manifest at this last deliverance session? They teach that you have to have more than one deliverance session done. And my argument would be for this is that as a Christian, I don't see where there's freedom being talked about, true freedom in Christ. Um, I, I see that there's far less talk of biblical discipleship, of the understanding of sanctification. Um, and if people are manifesting demons and they're professing believers in Christ, then I would say the first thing to go back to is to make sure they're even a believer. To make sure they've heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I've heard some ministers say that that, deli that casting out demons is has to happen as part of the gospel. Um, I would disagree with that. that. That is not something that has to happen with the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is centered around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The atonement for sin, the call to repentance... And the promise of eternal life by faith in Christ alone. And what I'm having trouble with, and again, as someone who was part of doing this stuff and, and saw this and saw it firsthand, participate in it. I was overseas and participated in deliverance ministry um, and, and seeing all these things. And now I think back and I go, okay, well, are believers, are born again believers still under the bondage of Satan? Are they still entrapped, ensnared in the bondage of Satan? Um, if we are still enslaved to Satan as Christians, what is the point of salvation? W where is the good news in all of that? That's the question I have. And where is the victory in Christ? Um, <clears throat> now, that's not to say that we're not going to go through things in life and that we're not going to. There's three opponents that we face in the world, the world, the flesh, and the devil in this life. There are three opponents in life that we face, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And um, I just don't see that talked about a whole lot in deliverance ministry. It's really a heavy focus on demons. And we really need to be heavily focused on Christ and not as a byproduct or secondary as far as, well, we have all the power now because of Christ, so we can go do all this stuff. Well, the gospel needs to be at the forefront of all that we do. Preach Christ and him crucified. Paul talked about that. Um, that may not be a um, attractive message or it may not be a message that, um, you know, I'm going to say this, but it may not be an attractive message that gets PayPal accounts filled up or cash app uh, accounts filled up, but it's crucial. It is sufficient to save Romans uh, 1 16, 17 says for the um, for the gospel has is the power of God unto salvation for, for the Jew first and then for the, the Greek or the Gentile. Um, there is tremendous amount of power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the concern I have is that there is again, there's not a lot of biblical discipleship. There's not a lot of sanctification talk of sanctification or teaching on sanctification going on. We have people that are continuing to, to chase after deliverance ministers. They're continuing to have deliverance sessions. And whether or not they have demons or not is, um, that's one question to ask. But the next one is, do they even have an understanding of the gospel and all these, and these other biblical doctrines that they need to understand and to realize that they're in a fallen world and they're going to face things and not everything's the devil. Not everything's a demon. Okay. Um, so these are questions, these are fair questions to ask. I know some people don't like these questions being asked, but they are fair questions to ask. And I'm going to ask them because I can, because I'm supposed to as a, as a believer in Christ, and so are you. Um, they talk about um, the word loose, which I mentioned that just a minute ago, about the multiple definitions, and you can't apply five definitions to one word in that passage, especially in the Greek. It has a specific meaning to it. Um, and I read page 74 to you all. So, um, also I understand our sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus and the atonement. So that was another thing that was interesting to me. They mentioned here, they said the blood must be personally applied. Every man who applies the blood by faith is saved. Those who refuse or neglect the, uh, to apply that blood are lost. So I may be misunderstanding what they're saying, but this almost sounds works-based to me. Um, we don't save... We can't meritoriously do something to save ourselves. It is faith in Christ alone. The Holy Spirit um, 
softening our hearts and opening our ears to be able to see and to hear the truth of the word of God and to be saved. Um, and it made me think of Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. So let me read that real quick. And I hope this is helpful. And again, if you don't agree, it's okay. Um, I noticed over the past, every time I post something, not even with this, but not necessarily, but if whenever I post stuff, um, <laughs> it's amazing how, <laughs> how the number of followers begin to drop or friends unfriend or uh, and stuff. And I just think, okay, well, that's fine if you don't want to listen. Um, but I just find it sad. I find it sad that we're not able to converse about things and disagree and still maintain some sort of conversation or friendship or acquaintance or something like that um, to continue to have the dialogue. Um, but that's the culture we're in right now. So Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, justification is a one-time thing, and that is done at the moment of salvation. That's a legal term where we are um, made, we are in right legal standing, if you will, before God through salvation. That is a one-time thing. And then sanctification is an ongoing process. We see this in the Word of God. We see this in Scripture. And so that is something that we as Christians need to understand. And that does not give us a a um, that does not give us a reason to sin or you know greasy grace or anything that anybody talks but about like that. But it helps us to understand that there is still a continual process. We're not glorified. I mean, last time I checked, I'm not in my glorified body. I don't know if you are, but I'm not. And so I need the Savior. I need the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be ever interceding for me. I need to be have that access to where I can go boldly before the throne of grace to have that fellowship with God. I need that. I haven't arrived and I would dare say that you haven't either. <laughs> so that's why we need the savior. And that's good news. This is not something that helps us to go, well, we, you know, we can do whatever we want. You know, people will read into that and they'll say, well, you know, you just believe that you can just sin and do whatever you want. No, I don't because I've read first John. And 1 John clearly says that, that those that are in Christ, they, don't, they do not keep on sinning. That is, they, those that keep on sinning and doing that, they habitually do it and they make it a lifestyle. There's no conviction from the Holy Spirit. There's no inward transformation. Their heart has not been changed. It has not been cleansed by Christ. They don't understand what it truly means to be born again, to be regenerated. There's no evidence. There's no fruit in their life in bearing with keeping with repentance. There's a difference in that. So 1 John, if you haven't read that, read it. 1 John's great to help us understand that. And it also helps us to see that John was dealing with the Gnostics of that time. There's a lot of different things you can learn from John. That he was addressing the Gnostics that were questioning the physical resurrection of Christ. They were um, disparaging the, the body versus the spirit. And they were basically uh, referred to as antichrists by John. So he was addressing some of these things and addressing the fact that Jesus did in fact resurrect. And he did come in the flesh. And that he there was an incarnation as opposed to what they were saying. So again, another topic, another day. So I do agree with them. Uh, they did talk about the end of this book in this chapter. I'm sorry, sorry, in chapter 15. They talk about that it is not within the authority of men to command angels. Um, and I would agree with that. And they say that it is extremely dangerous to elevate angels to a higher role than is established in Scripture. For one thereby begins to look to angels for help rather than to the Lord. And that it amounts to idolatry and may soon degenerate into a worship of angels, which is altogether forbidden. And they reference Colossians 2.18. Um, so I would agree with them on that. We are not to worship angels. We can't command angels, by the way. Those are the Lord's angels. So there are people out there that teach that you can command angels and that you can loose angels. There's no such biblical passage to tell you that that takes place by your doing. And not even under, under authority. And by the way, we are under authority. We do have some authority in the world, in the earth. As believers, but we are under authority. We are under authority. Um, so I do agree with them in that sense. 
about angels. And then they said at the end of this chapter, to reiterate, the binding refers to Satan and demons and the loosing to the person who has been bound by the forces of darkness. Satan is bound, the victim is loosed. This is what happens as a result of an effective deliverance ministry. Now, let's take a look at this before we move on to chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. What in the world does this passage mean? Well, I looked up on gotquestions.org. This is a good place to go if you have some questions. There's lots of other good places to go, I'm sure. But this is a really good place to go. So gotquestions.org, I typed this in, and lo and behold, there was a question up. It said, what does the Bible mean by binding and loosing? So they talk about here, I'm just going to read a little bit. The concept of binding and loosing is taught in the Bible, Matthew 16, 19. And in this verse, Jesus is speaking directly to the apostle Peter and indirectly to the other apostles. Jesus' words meant that Peter would have the right to enter the kingdom himself, that he would have general authority symbolized by the possession of the keys, and that preaching the gospel would be the means of opening the kingdom of heaven to all believers and shutting it against unbelievers. The book of Acts shows us this process at work. By his sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Verses 14 through 40, Peter opened the door of the kingdom for the first time. The expressions bind and loose were common to Jewish phraseology, meaning to declare something forbidden or to declare it aloud. Hold on a second. I brought my water. All right. It says, Peter and the other disciples were to continue Christ's work on earth and preaching the gospel and declaring God's will to men, and they were armed with the same authority as he possessed. And it goes on to talk about Matthew 18, that this is also a reference to binding and loosing in the context of church discipline. Um, which, by the way, that, that passage that people like to quote, where two or three are gathered, I am there in the midst of them, in the context, that deals with church discipline. Just as a side note. Um, it says, The apostles do not usurp Christ's lordship and authority over individual believers, and their eternal destiny. But they do exercise the authority to, decide, to discipline and, if necessary, excommunicate disobedient church members. So <clears throat> I encourage you to go look that up on your own and, and do some Bible study on that if you'd like um, and test what I'm saying. So Jesus is speaking to Peter and to the other apostles indirectly, and he's telling them, that they had been given, uh, the, the the Pharisees would have recognized this, by the way, when they heard the binding and loosing, it, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the passage, they were not happy when they heard that because they realized that Jesus is speaking their language and they understand that. What it means is that the apostles have been given the authority by Christ to say if a person can or cannot enter the kingdom of God, and that would be based on that person's receiving of the gospel receiving of the good news of Jesus Christ, repentance for their sin, the atonement for their sin, cleansing them from all unrighteousness, the promise of eternal life because of his, his resurrection from the, uh, from the grave. So that's the power they had. That is not a proof text to say that we have all this power to bind and loose. And by the way, I would also challenge, as I have before in these, on these lives, I would challenge where believers are told to bind up Satan. Because angels didn't even bind up Satan. Um, this is talked about in, in 1 Peter. It's also talked about in the book of Jude. Um, that angels didn't even rebuke Satan or bind Satan. So we're not, we're not told to do that. And another thing I see happening too with deliverance ministers, because sometimes I can't help myself but to watch even like Zoom calls with deliverance ministry, um, There's actual things about that if, you, if you're not familiar. There's Zoom calls out there where people do deliverance ministry over Zoom. And there are ministers that will start binding up Satan. And, and, and then they're binding up all these other spirits. And it's almost like they're kind of pulling out from different areas and just like a shotgun approach. But also, too, um, I mean, it goes without saying, Satan is not omnipresent. So... We can't just speak out into the air and um, speak to demons or speak to them. Ha you know, I think the last time I did one of these, it was talk uh, uh, several weeks ago. Um, they gave the account in this book where they were talking from hundreds of miles away to the demons. You don't see that practice in scripture at all. And I'm going to stick with scripture. I, I'm not, and I, 
you know, regardless of anybody's personal account, personal testimony, as far as that's concerned, outside of the Bible and saying these things, um, we don't see a precedent like that in Scripture to be doing that. And um, when we see devils being cast out, they were either in the presence of Jesus or they were in the presence of the apostles indwelling those people. They were testifying of Christ, by the way. The demons were testifying of Christ because they knew who Jesus was. And we see that they were cast out in that the presence of that person. We don't ever see any accounts in scripture of someone praying hundreds of miles away and ca or casting out demons hundreds of miles away. Okay. Um, again, I may get pushed back on that. Again, I encourage you, go back to scripture. Go back to scripture. Um, the next context I wanted to look at was in Romans 5.17. So Romans 5.17, and I'm going to turn there in my Bible because I think we need to read some context here. They referenced Romans 5.17 in the fact that we are to rule and reign now and that we do this through um, binding the power of the devil and loosing the captive. So let's read what Romans 5.17 actually means. Um, <clears throat> let's back up to verse 12 so we can see the context of it. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more had the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many." And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, this, and this is the verse they quoted, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore is one trespass, led to condemnation for all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So this has nothing to do with binding up demons and loosing people from the power of Satan, which essentially what we could say is, and it doesn't mean that people have demons, but the God of this world, the little G, is Satan. And he is ruling over this world because, and we know that because sin still abounds. And he is the original, he was the one that helped to bring sin into the world because of rebellion. Adam rebelled against God. It says that death came through Adam because he rebelled against God through the one man. But then what Christ did, he redeemed people and he justified people. There we go again with that word justification, the, the right legal standing before God. And so we see that Verse 17 is not dealing with what they said. It's not dealing with saying, well, we are to rule and reign now and we are to have power over the devil now um, by casting him out of other believers and doing this. We rule and reign over the devil because of Christ, because Christ defeated Satan and he defeated the power of sin. And as a believer in Christ, we are, we are um, saved from the penalty of sin and in through sanctification, we are saved uh, from the power of sin. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us so that we can know how to overcome, so we can kill sin, so that we can be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh, so that we are regenerated, so that we walk in the ways of God, so that we testify Him, so that we walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that we glorify Christ, so that we're made a new creation, that old things have passed away and the new has come. That sounds a, a whole lot better news than to continue to tell professing born-again believers, well, you still need to have deliverance done. You have a demon. Yeah. So, yeah, Romans 5, 17 in the context is not talking about demons. It's talking about the power that Christ has through his death, burial, and resurrection and what he did to atone for sin and that he brings life to reign in life because of his 
power and authority over the devil and what he did on the cross versus what Adam did, it brought death. But what Christ did brings life. That's the difference. So if a believer can still have demons dwelling in them, then where's the conquering, uh, 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 where's the, the conquering of, Sa of uh, Christ over Satan? Doesn't sound like there's a lot of victory there. Again, I know some may disagree, and it's okay. Um, I'm, I want to give you food for thought here. And again, as someone who was once part of this movement and participated in things like this, I want to give you some food for thought. And not just read these books and think, oh, they're so great, and they're so wonderful, and they're so anointed, and you don't, you're not even doing what you should be doing as a believer, which is being a, a good Berean. You should be testing it to make sure that it is what it, what it says is so. It doesn't matter who wrote it. I don't care if that person has a million followers. It needs to be tested because it's not scripture. <laughs> and if they're referencing scripture, that needs to be tested too. The last thing in this book I want to talk about, they talk about 1 John 3, 8, the second half. So they said 1 John 3, 8, B. So let's go to 1 John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, um, I'm going to read, um, let's see, I'll read verses 1 through 10. I think that'll give us some context there because they talk about, again, to, see, to go back to the context, they said, they said, Satan has his strong man appointed over nations, cities, churches, homes, and individuals. God is showing us that these strong men have already been defeated and bound by heaven's power. And then they quote, for this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. For what purpose? They so they quoted the last half of that verse. So we don't know for, for this purpose, for what purpose? Let's read. First uh, John chapter three, verse one. See what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practice law, practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sin, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. <coughs> verse 8, this is the whole thing of verse 8, okay? Not the second half, the whole verse of verse 8. There's another reason why you got to pay attention when people are quoting verses in their books that they're writing because they're quoting the second half of something and it has nothing to do with what they're talking about. Nothing. This has nothing to do with de demons. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Now, it does mention the devil, but it doesn't mention that these are believers that need de devils cast out is what I'm getting at. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And he already said a few verses prior to that, whoever keeps on sinning does not know God. They're not believers. So he's addressing believers in Christ and telling them whoever keeps on sinning, it's of the devil because they are in agreement with the devil. Because the, the devil is the little G of this world. He is the God of this world. <sighs> For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Um, so we see here, again, this has nothing to do with principalities being set over nations and cities and all these other regions and that we are to have uh, rule and reign over them at, based on 1 John 3, 8. <coughs> Excuse me. It has nothing to do with that. So this is why I just want to encourage you. Please go back to the word. Please go back to the word. Um, it is so important that we that we go to the word. Now, the second chapter, we'll try to get this finished up here. So, and I'm sorry I have to do this so late, but I have young children, and so I have to get them to bed and I have to work with the time that I have. So if you can't watch it now, you can always come back and watch it later if you, if you want to watch it. If you don't want to watch it, it's okay. Chapter 16, pros and cons on techniques and methods. 
So I want to read a little bit on page 77 on chapter 16. Um, they basically talk about <coughs> creating rules and the drawback of, of making rules and deliverance ministry, but then they go on to actually create rules and doctrine. So they kind of negate what they're saying a little bit, but nevertheless, they say, I have observed that different persons involved in deliverance ministry utilize somewhat different methods. This is understandable in as much as the Bible does not give much detail as to methods employed by either Jesus or his disciples. And it doesn't, it doesn't give detail, but we do see a lot of detail being given out today for deliverance ministry. Um, we must not get bound up in little rules, which we have made for ourselves. How do such rules come into being? If we get success through using a certain technique, then we are prone to conclude that it was the technique that did the trick. I have found that the Holy Spirit enjoys variety and that we can rely upon him for whatever technique is required. Okay, so they're discussing the, the drawbacks of having uh, rules for deliverance. But yeah, as you're going to see as we go through here, they tend to establish rules. Um, <coughs> so... Um, and they, they also say on the same page, if we start looking for methods and techniques, we will end up in hopeless confusion. That is exactly what the devil would like us to do. So the first thing they talk about is the laying on of hands. And they reference, first of all, I'm not trying to be nitpicky, but I did find something that was definitely, most definitely an error in this book. They reference Luke chapter 4, verse 29 where Jesus prays for Peter's mother-in-law and uh, they talk about how Jesus rebuked the fever and they say that Jesus spoke to that fever as if it had a personality. Well, that's actually not the right verse. So when you go to Luke 4, 29, that's actually talking about when Jesus was in Nazareth and the people were so angry with him because of some of the things that he said to them that they they took him, they grabbed a hold of him and took him up to a, on top of a hill and they took him on the edge of a cliff to throw him off. That's the verse. But when you go to Luke 4, 38 and 39, that's where you actually see. So that was probably just um, a mistake, on an honest mistake on their part, which how many of us have made that honest mistake? That's easy to do. But just wanted to let you know in case you read, read that book. Again, this is why you need to go to Scripture because that is not the right passage that's being referenced. Anyway, um, Luke 4, 38 through 39 um, it says that Jesus rebuked the fever and they do, they make the point in this book, as I said, that he treated the fever as a personality, which they're implying that, that Peter's mother-in-law had a demon. That's what they're getting at there. And that's not the first time I've heard that said, um, that, that, uh, Peter's mother-in-law had a demon cast out of her. It doesn't say that in scripture that's being read into the text. And the question, excuse me, the question that I have when someone says that and they say, well, you know, Jesus spoke to, um, in Luke anyway, now he didn't do it in the other gospels when it's mentioned, but when he's talking to the fever in Luke four and they want, and people want to make a, um, an argument and say, well, he talked to the fever as if it was a personality. Okay. Well, if you're going to apply that logic there, then you have to also apply it in the account in the Gospels, in all four Gospels, where Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Was he speaking to a personality there? Or was he speaking to the elements that had to obey him? Because the disciples even marveled at what Jesus did there. And they were marveling and saying, by what authority does he speak that even the wind and waves obey him? He wasn't speaking to demons. He was speaking to the things which he created and they had to obey him because he was in authority and he still is an authority. He never lost authority. Never. And he didn't lose authority in the garden either, by the way. Contrary to what some of those beliefs are, and I was taught that stuff for years by, by uh, I was under a lot of Kenneth Hagin's teachings when I was in Bible college and things like that in the church I was part of. So there is this teaching that God lost his dominion, lost his authority because he gave it to man and then man gave it over to Satan because he sinned. 
So then God has to have legal rights to get into the earth for human beings? That's nowhere in scripture. God can do whatever he wants to do because God is sovereign and he doesn't need our permission to do it, by the way. That is not um, the true living God to worship, a God that needs our permission to do anything. <laughs> huh, another side note. But um, so the laying on of hands, they discuss this in here. And that, and again, that's the question I have with this. If you're going to assign a personality to when Jesus rebuked the fever of the mother-in-law, then you must be consistent and you must say that there was a demon in the wind and the waves. And there's nothing that says that there. Jesus was speaking because of his authority as the son of God who created the world. And he was speaking to the elements that had to obey him. Just like he had to speak with, he spoke with authority and rebuked that fever. We are not ever told that it was a demon. Um, so let's see. Um, they discussed the person, uh, person exper uh, personal experience with deliverance and laying on of hands. And they mentioned this thing called a touch-me-not spirit. Now, you may be asking, what is a touch-me-not spirit? Well, they said that they've encountered people that they get worse with the demon manifestations when they're touched. So they have assigned a name to it called the touch-me-not spirit. So they've learned that when those people manifest that they don't, they shouldn't touch them. And they also make a big deal about whether a man or woman should be ministering to them or touching them, um, which I get that in a natural sense of being appropriate. So that way you're not accused of different things that are, uh, um, that are inappropriate. But at the same time, what they're getting at is <clears throat> in one particular instance, um, they said uh, he was this uh, actually Frank Hammon was praying for this woman and she began to manifest with demons and when she did that, he had he was at her back. He could not see her face. So these other two men were in front of her, and they were all praying for her. And he, according to him, um, he said that the Holy Spirit told him to stop praying, and that he turned went to the, her face, and that she was flirting. That she had a flirting spirit. She was flirting with these men. And he said, "Quote, let me find it." He said, "The touch of a male hand would serve to feed such a spirit." That's weird. That seems strange to me that, um, I don't know. Some of, the, some of this stuff is anecdotal. Um, we're some of this, uh, in these chapters, you're relying on personal experience. This is not going back to scriptural teaching. Um, Jesus didn't lay hands on everybody that was healed or that the demons were cast out. So we know that that wasn't the case, that it was by his word many times when he spoke that and that they had to obey. And there's, um, you know, there are scriptural references for laying on of hands. Doesn't necessarily refer to deliverance ministry, um, which they did touch a little bit on that in here. And there were some things they said that I would tend to agree with on that, but we'll stick with the deliverance part of this. So we have some more understanding. So that was a, a, a bizarre statement to me when he said, well, the touch of a male would feed this spirit. Um, it almost seemed like there was a disconnect from saying, well, you know, as a believer, you have the Holy spirit. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to word this, but it was just really strange um, to make such a point. They go on to talk about on page 80, they said the principle is this, that no demon can attack us or enter us unless it has an opening to do so. Um, now as we go on here, the next section that they talk about, uh, which I, uh, excuse me, as in the same section two of laying on of hands, they talk about that with this, that some uh, ministers will get fearful because demons will threaten to go into them and again, this is all based on this teaching of believing that Christians can have indwelling demons, but then saying at the same time, well, it's the power of the Holy Spirit in me that casts out demons, but you're allegedly casting demons out of born-again believers that have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So do they have a different Holy Spirit than you do? Um, fair question to ask. <laughs> Um, just, just things that personally, when I'm thinking about this stuff and really testing it against scripture, these are things to consider. Um, the next section they talk about in this chapter, in chapter 16 is conversing with demons. They say it is not possible to stop all demon talk when dealing with them in deliverance. 
They will sometimes speak out without warning. They did this with Jesus. Yeah, they did do that with Jesus. And Jesus also told them to be quiet. And they had to obey him because he's the son of God. It does talk about that. But Jesus told them to shut up or to be quiet. And they did that. They had to do what Jesus said to do. They obeyed the apostles because the apostles had the authority to cast them out because Jesus gave them that authority to do that. When you look at the context of the passages in scripture, that's the context. Now, there will be those who will ask, well, where, where do you think demons go now? Do you not believe in demons? I do believe in demons. I just don't believe that Christians can have indwelling demons. And I think, that, and I not, I personally believe, as looking at scripture, if there are people that are slithering around on the floor and they're hissing like snakes and they're manifesting all these things and um, being told to cough up something in order to prove that they've been delivered and then, um, you know, having all this stuff go on that they're manifest, manifesting these things, then the first thing we need to be going back to is making sure these people have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ has enough power in it to set people free from demons. And I think it's rather, um, it's disturbing when, when I hear ministers say, they're adding to and saying, well, you must do this in addition to presenting the gospel in order for there to be power. Then you are stripping power from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the, and the gospel doesn't need any more power. It is powerful enough to, it saves people. It's powerful enough to save us. Then it's powerful enough to deliver us from demons. And the Holy Spirit helps us. We are no longer, again, the whole issue is sanctification. We are saved from the power of sin. And sin is connected essentially to the devil. Again, it doesn't mean that you have an indwelling demon. But when we sin, we, bec we come in agreement, if you will, with the devil and his nature. And so this is something that as sanctification as believers, we live in a fallen world and we continue to understand that we have victory because of Christ. And it is not good news to tell Christians that they need to continue to have deliverance. If you want to cast demons out of people, then I would encourage you to fill up your uh, venues for deliverance ministers. I would encourage you to fill up your venues with unbelievers, with people that are depraved, reprobate, wicked, and don't know Christ. And let's see how many demons you cast out and that you can also minister the gospel to them and get them filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, there are people that testify to not actually doing this whole thing of, you come out, devil, you come out, devil, I bind you. What's your name? Putting a mic... Okay, that's another thing. I'll just get on this quick tangent. Those people that you see putting a microphone up to people's um, mouths and letting that demon talk, you know what's happening right there? That is a whole soap opera taking place in a drama for added effect in order to pump up the crowd and add more excitement. And it's, and it's ridiculing that person. That should not be going on. We are not told in scripture to converse with demons. If there was even a true demon there, we are not told to converse with demons. Just because one account in scripture where Jesus speaks to the man of the Gadarenes that had the legion of demons, which the argument could easily be made that that instance took place because Jesus showed that he had authority over that many demons. And they had to have permission to go into the pigs, by the way. They couldn't go on their own. They had to ask for permission from Jesus to do that. So that one text people will use and say, well, we can talk to demons. We are, that is not a prescriptive text. It is descriptive. We're never told to do that. If you want to cast out demons, then start with the gospel. Start ministering. Make sure you know what the gospel is. Make sure that you can minister the gospel according to scripture, which the gospel, by the way, is not your testimony. Your testimony is valid and it's valuable to, to uh, help people understand how for, what Christ has done in you, but that is not the gospel. The gospel is centered on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and we know that by the scriptures. And if we can't tell people what the gospel is according to scriptures, then we've got a big problem. And scripture is powerful enough because of the word of God and who it testifies of to save people and to 
got to direct them back to Jesus Christ who saves them by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. All right. Um, let's see. So, um, hold on a second. Okay. So then they go on to talk about, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. They go on to talk about on page 82 under the same uh, topic of conversing with demons. They say the Bible strictly forbids such communication with demons. I would agree with that. Um, the Christian has the Holy, they go on to say the Christian has the Holy Spirit as his source of knowledge, wisdom, and guidance. Well, what about power? Doesn't the Christian have also the Holy Spirit to be endued with power? You see how, I mean, again, I know people are going to disagree, but do you see how this begins to crumble some of the deliverance ministry teaching and doctrine that's been perpetuated for years from these books? When you tell people you speak out of one side of your mouth and you say, well, the Holy Spirit gives you guidance and knowledge and wisdom, but you're a Christian, you can still have demons. But the scripture tells us that we're endued with power, that we can kill sin by the Spirit, according to Romans 13. So, which is it? We have power over, over demons. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so, does the Christian have the Holy Spirit as the source of power over demons? Something to consider. The next topic they go to in chapter 16 is interruptions during ministry. They say the minister must realize that he is the servant of the Lord Jesus and moving in the power and authority granted him, he and not the demon's power is in command of the situation. A ministry may be prolonged. When I say ministry, they mean a deliverance session. It can extend over several hours. The one being ministered to, as well as the deliverance minister, may need a few minutes to rest. It is usually convenient to break the ministry after a group of spirits has been cast out. No ground is lost when such a break is taken. You simply begin where you left off. Is that practiced in scripture? Do we see that taking place? Or do we see immediate or quickly that there is deliverance taking place both by Jesus and the apostles? Do we see that there's a break and we, we begin to say to people, hey, can you just tell that demon to, to temper down? And I I know I'm, I'm being facetious when I say this, but... Um, this is kind of like the picture this painting. Well, you know, we'll just deal with these other demons in a little bit. We need like a 10 minute break. Does that sound odd to anybody else? <clears throat> um, so if the believer is in command, why is a break necessary? Because that kind of seems like the, the demon's in command, really, in an indirect way. If we're having to take a break and it's not wanting to come out. Why do we not see in the New Testament the example of demons taking hours or several sessions with breaks needed? Um, a few things to consider. And then the last thing is the positions of the body. So they talk about since demons are expelled primarily through the mouth or nose. That's a doctrine, by the way. This is not taught in scripture. And again, I know that there are people that will say, well, I've seen this happen and I've experienced this, but your experiences must be tested against scripture. And we, we need to be testing ourselves to see if we're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13.5. I mean, that some of this has been adopted and, and essentially another argument that could be made is, is that people are assigning demons to sin, that people are not addressing sin because of their flesh or they're not addressing it because of the, the, the temptations from the world. And it goes back to improper biblical discipleship and it goes back to improper understanding of sanctification and it goes back to probably even not being saved or born again because the gospel has never been fully presented and there's been a misunderstanding and a contortion of the gospel. Those are possibilities that have to be considered. 
they have to be considered. <clears throat> so um, there's no teaching in the Bible that tells us that demons come out through the mouth or the nose. There's no teaching or doctrine that supports having buckets or trash cans for people to vomit in. There's no support in scripture for saying that that person has to, to manifest for a demon to come out. And again, when you're talking to born again believers, there should be a red flag here. Should be a red flag. Um, a doctrine has been created with that. Um, they go on in the last part of this, we're almost done. Um, the last part of this, they give an example of a man with demons at a meeting. And this, uh, Frank Hammond was at a meeting uh, where a minister, a prominent minister, he says that was in deliverance, was conducting a group deliverance. Um, he said it was a large meeting, over a hundred people were there and they had gone forward for deliverance. And the minister asked for those who had experience in, excuse me, in deliverance to mix in with the group to assist. One young man near me was immediately taken over and fell to the floor. He was coughing violently and the demons were coming out with phlegm from his mouth. It was in the summer and the air conditioning had gone off and it was unbearably hot. A little crowd had gathered around and I could see that the man was getting extremely uncomfortable. He had paused in the process of deliverance. Again, that seems very strange to me that someone takes a pause in the middle of deliverance ministry. And um, Frank Hammond says that he suggested that, that the man sit up for a few minutes. And then he says another deliverance minister rebuked him, saying that this man needed to be in a specific posture in order to get delivered. And that he disagrees with that because um, that's not necessary. So you'll see even discrepancies between del deliverance ministers that they don't agree with, with different things. They've created their own different beliefs and doctrines and practices and such with that. Um, <clears throat> so... That's the end of my notes. <laughs> that was abrupt. Okay, so that took, us, that took us through chapters 15 and 16 of Pigs in the Parlor. Um, so again, I hope that this was helpful. I'm, going, I'm trying to do a couple of chapters at a time. And um, I don't look forward to getting to chapter 21. That's the, that's the chapter I really, I may have to do by itself because it's a bit longer chapter. That's the chapter on schizophrenia. Um, it's a very disturbing chapter. There's um, extra biblical revelation that's been established by Ida Mae Hammond in that. And essentially saying that anybody who has schizophrenia has demons. Um, and, you know, again, before I get off here, let me just say this. I was one of these people that used to believe that there were many demons assigned to a lot of issues and when people acted out or had things that happened or if there had physical ailments it was immediately well the devil's just attacking the devil's just doing this the devil's doing that and I understand that there that the devil is real the devil is real demons are real um, biblical spiritual warfare is real I'm not denying that. What I find wildly unhelpful now is that assigning a demon to almost anything and negating the other two, again, the two other two opposing factors that we have in this life. And then to, to realize the fallenness of this world and that there are people that deal with mental illness and it's not always demonic. There could be some chemical imbalance in their body. <clears throat> and I know that some people that are word of faith will not enjoy that talk. Because we should watch what, watch what we say. Because they'll proof text Proverbs 18 and say, you know, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Which again, that has nothing to do. We cannot speak things into existence. We don't have that power. Regardless of what anybody says, we don't have that power. Um, we can encourage and discourage. We can certainly influence people's lives and our own lives by, by the things that we say and the things that we do. But we don't have the power to create with our words like God does. But there are people that deal with mental illness in this world. There are people that have chemical imbalances. There are people that have 
different things. And it's not because they have a demon. It's because we are in a fallen world that is not, re not uh, redeemed yet. That still, um, it's been subjected to futility, according to Romans 8. And it's groaning and it's longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Not because of who we are, but because when we're, when that happens, that means the newness is coming in fullness and there's no more futility any longer. And things will be as they were intended to be by God's will. And when I read things like this and I see this whole chapter devoted to dealing with schizophrenia and assigning multiple demons to schizophrenia, I can't imagine the amount of damage that that does to somebody who probably doesn't have a demon, that they really have a mental illness because of the fallenness of this world, because of sin and rebellion that came in through Adam, and that there are things that people are dealing with. Um, <clears throat> and they need the gospel, first and foremost. And praying that they're healed, praying that God would renew their minds, would re would restore them. And God is able. He, he heals and he does miracles. Um, not by our will, not by our command and demand. He does them according to his will. And again, that's not something that we like to hear, but that's what scripture tells us. Um, so if you st if you hold to deliverance ministry, I would I would strongly encourage you. And I'm when I'm saying deliverance ministry, I'm saying people that are teaching that they only do deliverance ministry on Christians, and that they are perpetuating this doctrine of you have to have deliverance, you have to you have to do these certain things, you can still have indwelling demons even though you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within you. They try to compartmentalize between body and soul and spirit in that aspect. And you're holding to this doctrine. Please go back to scripture. Please don't assign a demon to everything. Um, realize that you're going to go through things in this world and the devil's not attacking you. It's not Satan. I'm sure Satan has got far bigger fish to fry. Um, certainly we can be outwardly attacked as believers. I do believe we can be outwardly attacked and we can certainly be influenced in this world <clears throat> by the things that are essentially demonic because they, if sin agrees with, um, if, if there's sin taking place, it is lawlessness is what uh, we read in first John three. And that it is, a, is an agreement with Satan essentially. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's a demon behind everything and assigning a demon to everything is avoiding accountability. And we're not going to be able to stand before God and to say, well, the devil made me do it. I didn't, I didn't sin. I didn't have whatever it is that we have. Oh, I didn't have this. I didn't have a lying problem. I didn't have a sexual immorality problem. Um, that, that was a demon that did that. I didn't do that. You, you're not going to be able to use that. We can't. And as believers in Christ, we stand before Christ, just before God, justified because we are clothed, we are hidden in Christ. We're clothed in his righteousness. His righteousness has been imputed to us, and in return, our sin has been imputed to him. He's atoned for it. So we stand before the Father justified. And then as believers, we continue on to be sanctified through this life. We walk in the ways of the Lord. We walk by the, we are led by the spirit, not by the flesh. And we must know what scripture says. And we must know what it says in context in order to do that. So, um, I hope this helps somebody. And if you get mad at me, then, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm not going to quit talking about this stuff because it does help people. I get messages um, quite frequently that it, that this stuff helps people. And I get messages that are not so nice. And um, I just have to be okay with that and realize that I'm going to um, keep saying things and, and speaking the truth according to the word of God. 
and that's it. Because I want to please him. I'm not concerned about pleasing man. If I was, I would continue to do what I was doing. I could easily, I'm sure I could easily spout out some prophetic words and do all the other things I used to do. And I'm sure I would gain lots of followers. And <clears throat> in fact, since doing all this, I've, that's been the exact opposite. Um, and it's okay. It's okay. So um, I hope that you'll join me for next time when we look at the next two chapters. And I hope to be able to do that soon. Um, like I said, I apologize for it not being sooner, but there were some family issues that we were dealing with and um, medical procedures and things that we were having to um, take care of. And so I look forward to being on here with you again next time. And hopefully it won't be so late, but that's how it goes with life. And <laughs> sometimes I try to work that out. Anyway, all you mothers have a wonderful Mother's Day. Have a blessed rest of your weekend. I'll see you on here again soon. Be blessed.